All right, we're going to officially get started. Welcome and thank you for joining us today for our lunch presentation on managing sales tax audits and compliance. If you want to learn some best practices on managing sales tax compliance and preparing for a sales tax audit, you are in the right spot. Just starting late, but you are in the right spot. I want to welcome everybody and our partners at the BNMA. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Carolyn Powell, Business Development Director here at Tronconi Segura & Associates, and I'll be your host today. Just want to point out the toolbar to your side. There is a questions. If you want to submit any questions during the presentation, you can do that. But also, kind of more importantly, there's a handout section. We have a copy of the presentation in there if you want to download that. But also, Tom's going to refer to some tax forms and examples. Those are in the handout, so if you want to just take a quick second and pop those out and download them so you can follow along when Tom refers to them. And then also, too, in there is Tom's bio. So grab those as we, we slowly get started. Also, after the presentation today, there'll be a quick survey. Let us know if this was helpful. Give us feedback and let us know if you want to follow up directly with Tom if you have some additional questions that you want to ask. So without further ado, let's get started. Tronconi Skier & Associates, we're a certified public accounting and business consulting firm. Tom Mazurk is a CPA with over 20 years in public accounting with a broad range of industry experience, manufacturing, food, financial services, software, environmental, remediation, electronic commerce. Um, I'm sure I missed something. There was, it was a long list, but he does have a, a broad background in that. So I'm going to hand it over to Tom and get us started so we keep on time today for you. Thank you, Carolyn. Sorry about the technical issue there, folks. Hopefully we have everything fixed. Uh, this is a presentation. Haven't done it in a long time, but it's one I've always thought was very informative provided a lot of good information for businesses related to sales tax compliance and managing audits. We're gonna talk about all different aspects of sales tax compliance here from start to finish. So even if your business has been collecting and remitting tax for a long time, I think this is a good refresher on the different issues that can affect your compliance here in New York. Uh, we are you know, primarily talking about New York State, but a lot of the concepts and issues I'm talking about really relate to other states as well that you might be, you know, collecting tax in. So, you know, to get started here on the next slide, uh, really, just like I said, a refresher on some of the registration requirements. Who needs to register and collect and remit tax in New York? Generally speaking, if you're a business that has taxable sales, and honestly, it's pretty, one, pretty much anyone who is making sales of tangible personal property, you need to register for what we call a certificate of authority here in New York State that allows you to collect sales tax. And that's the first document that I have attached in the handouts. Um, you still receive one of these from the state in the mail. It's usually like a pink colored form that has your identification number on it and whatnot. But um, what we typically suggest is you should register at least 20 days before your business is going to start. Um, in New York, it takes about five days to process, but it could be longer before you get the actual certificate of authority. And in some cases, you need to display that, you know, within your business location. You know, I would give myself more time, honestly, than 20 days. Um, these days with COVID and the states, you know, coming back to the work and working remotely, we've seen that things are taking a lot longer to process and whatnot, um, especially if you're registering for tax sales tax in other states. Um, some of them aren't as quick as New York. Some of them might be actually quicker. But in some cases, when you're dealing with, you know, a different state, there might be other issues, other questions uh, you're going to need to provide information for. So definitely, definitely want to give yourself an adequate amount of time. So with the certificate of authority, you can see the example I provided here. Um, you cannot legally 
obviously make a taxable sale without this document. And just as important, and I think a lot of people don't understand or really realize this, you cannot issue or accept a lot of different exemption certificates until you've received your certificate of authority. So if you're a business that's like a manufacturer who's buying raw material for resale purposes, you can't issue that ST120 resale certificate in New York until you have that certificate of authority because you need to provide that number on the form. So you could end up paying sales tax or use tax on purchases that are exempt if you're not properly registered in the right time frame. These days, it's pretty easy to, to register for this in New York State. They have this Business Express website where I provided, uh, provided the link to the state tax department website that has some more information on being required to register and the information you need to provide. And there's links there to Business Express Typically, you I mean you're going to need your business contact information, the type of entity you are, the date you're beginning business, your bank account information, because you're going to be doing electronic filing for the most part. If you have a taxpayer, a tax preparer, their information as well. And then most importantly, I think the responsible person information. Uh, and we'll talk about that on, on another slide here, but that's really important as well. Since we are you know, doing this really for the BNMA and a lot of the manufacturers, just want to really reiterate this that, yeah, you know, with a manufacturer, you may not be making taxable sales, right? You might be selling to a distributor for resale or to someone else. In a lot of cases, your sales may not be subject to tax, but you do need those, you know, resale and exemption certificates. Um, to be issued for your material good purchases or your equipment purchases. So you definitely need to register to get that certificate of authority. We've run into that before a number of years ago with a local manufacturer. They were advised they didn't need to register because everything they sold was for resale. And you know, thereby they weren't issuing resale certificates to anybody. So they were paying sales tax on everything from raw materials to equipment to utilities. So we need to do a, a voluntary disclosure, you know, and help them register, you know, remit some tax that was due on the use tax side on purchases. And then we are able to go back and file a refund claim to recover the tax that they overpaid. So it does happen a lot with manufacturers. You need to be very, very careful about that. So with this obligation to collect and remit tax, you know, it's important to know, even if you have no tax due, maybe you had, you know, no taxable sales or no sales in a quarter or a month, whatever the period you're filing for, you still have to file that sales tax return. Even if it's a zero return, you can end up paying a $50 late filing penalty. You know, we run into this a lot, a lot as well, you know, with new businesses. You know, startups, they didn't realize, oh, I didn't have any sales. You know, there's nothing to report. Well, you're in the system. They're expecting to see your return, so you need to file that. And, you know, when I talk here about responsible persons, you know, really, that is somebody who is an owner officer of the corporation or company. If you're an individual, you know, you know with the Schedule C type business, that's the owner. If you're a partnership, that's your general partners, an LLC would be all the members or the appointed manager, you know, and for corp type entities, your, your officers, your CEO, CFO, president, treasury, treasurer, secretary, you have to list these people on your sales tax registration application, not just in New York, in all states, because if the business doesn't pay the tax for whatever reason, they need to go after somebody personally for that liability. So if you're just the controller, or you're just a tax manager, you don't really want to be the responsible person. It really needs to be a, an officer or an owner of the company who's listed on there. Because, and you know, we've seen it many times when the state issues a tax assessment, they may also issue an assessment to the owners, whoever's listed as a responsible person, because they need to make sure they're going to get their tax that's due. Talk here about some record keeping. 
you know, this is becoming really, really more important. I've run into a couple of issues now with audits, you know, in the last couple of years where, you know, we've, we've had issues with inadequate records or the auditors couldn't find the documentation they needed. You know, you need to keep these records for at least three years, uh, three years being the statute of limitations in New York. The state can't go back more than three years to audit you, you know, unless there's something you've done wrong or really, really messed up um, remitting tax, you know, to the tune of 25% or more of the liability. But for the most part, they can't go back more than three years. And the records you really need to keep, you know, for your sales, you want to have your invoices to your customers. You know, any types of contracts and supporting documentation like that, statements you've issued, anything that the auditors need to document, you know, your sales and reconcile those sales to your, your general ledger, your tax returns, whatnot. You have to have all that that ties out, you know, on your purchases, you know, any of the invoices, you know, for documents where you accrued use tax on or where you've claimed an exemption, you really need to have all those purchase records. You know, if you're using electronic filing or a, you're using a point of sale system, there's additional rules um, in this sales tax publication, ST770, you probably wanna look at to make sure you're meeting the standards and have the internal controls in place that they can rely on the system that you're using. And if you don't do this, I mean, there's got to be there's got to be negative consequences. You're going to have penalties and interests for failure to keep adequate records. They may use an estimated audit methodology if they deem your records are not complete or unreliable. And you know, when it gets to that, it gets to be really, really tough to fight. Um, you can have criminal penalties if you willfully fail to maintain records. You have your certificate of authority revoked or suspended. And the penalties aren't you know, small. We're not talking like a $50 late filing fee. We're talking up to $1,000 for the first quarter and up to $5,000 for additional quarters, plus other penalties as well. Uh, just dealing with this right now on an audit where the taxpayer just didn't have any records, didn't file returns. And um, you know they've got nailed with some of these record keeping penalties, unfortunately. So, we talked about, you know, your you know, registration, you know, what you need to have on that, the records you need to keep, but what about your sales and purchases? What's taxable and what's exempt? You know, for the most part, if you're selling tangible personal property, you really need to presume that that's going to be subject to sales tax. Um, TPP, tangible or personal property, typically subject to tax unless it's excluded by law such as you know food prescription drugs you know items like that that nobody pays tax on ever or they're exempt from tax you know meaning there's an exemption in the tax law that says if you're using this tangible personal property in a specific way it's exempt from tax and the biggest thing you know the production exemption manufacturing exemption um, is one of those big exemptions on the other hand Services are typically not taxable unless they're what we call specifically enumerated or listed in the tax law. So in New York, we're talking about security guard services, janitorial services, any type of real property repairs that don't rise to the level of capital improvement, installation or repair of tangible personal property, information services, utility services, and whatnot. So the, the big stuff like that. I mean, uh, a lot of states other than New York don't tax as many services, um, but here in New York, we have a pretty wide list of services that are enumerated. And all of these may be exempt from tax, you know, if you're buying them for resale or they're subject to, you know, uh, some other exemption. Yeah, and the same thing goes for purchases. You know, what you're buying as a business. You know, presumed taxable unless it's exempt. And, you know, if you're a manufacturer, if it's something, if it's equipment that's directly and predominantly used in the manufacturing process, that should be exempt from tax. You can go back to our prior webinar from February 
I think that my partner Andy Toth and I did on manufacturers in New York where we talk about all the different exemptions you know that are available. If anyone missed that they can find it on our YouTube page. Yep so. great. So if you are purchasing tangible personal property that is exempt you do need to provide what we're talking about. I keep referring to these resale and exemption certificates. So what, what are these? What's a resale certificate? Um, in New York, it's form ST120. It's in the handouts um, that I provided. You know, if you were going to buy tangible personal property or ser services that you're going to resell as is, or you're going to incorporate that item into something that you're manufacturing and selling, that's a resale exemption. So you need to provide this form to whoever you're buying that from, from that vendor. And you gotta provide your information as the purchaser, the seller's information on here. Uh, you need to include your certificate of authority number and then check the appropriate box you know, on, on the form here on the front of the ST120. It can also be used if you're you know, a non-New York purchaser and you're not required to be registered, but maybe um, you're, you're buying something that's being drop shipped and the drop shipper needs an exemption resale certificate, you can use this. And then you need to make sure it, it's signed and dated properly. Gotta have that certificate of authority. So then on the exemption certificate, so that's for resale. We also have what we call an exempt use certificate, this ST-121. You know, there's various, you know, exemptions that are on here that are based on the tax law that relate to whether something's for production, whether it's exempt because it's a service or some other type of exemption on page two that's listed. Uh, again, you know, you, you need to fill out that purchaser and seller information and then check the appropriate box for the exemption. You know, on page two, it gets more and more into, you know, page one is pretty much all your production exemptions, whether it's your typical machinery, equipment, parts, tools, and supplies, you know, consumed in the production of tangible personal property for sale, or if we're talking about production of a film or telecommunications or used in broadcasting, then you know that's all really the first page the second page of this goes into services you know if you're buying any services for re, you know that are exempt from tax or you know other exemptions whether they relate to research and development packaging materials if you're buying a commercial commercial vessel or aircraft or pollution control equipment that's all covered on page two and again you know, for some of these exemptions, you may not specifically need to have a certificate of authority, but you can see, you know, like on line A, box A on page one of this, you have to provide the number there. So you really need to be careful and make sure you have this and you're using it correctly. Because if you're not, you're gonna run into some, run into some issues here. Uh, again, you know, talked about using the right certificate. You know, for example, a contractor cannot use a resale certificate to buy materials. They have to pay tax on those materials that they're using, in, you know, to build a house or do work on a building or whatnot. But if they're doing work on an exempt job, maybe for a nonprofit or for a government agency, then they can use an ST120.1. So you need to make sure if you're selling to a contractor, they're using the right documentation because you're going to be on the hook for that tax, potentially, if you're audited down the road. Also, you know, you have, you have some time and you have to provide this if you're buying, you know, you know equipment or supplies or if you're selling it to somebody uh, for exempt purposes, you've got to get this certificate within 90 days. And you need to make sure it's completed correctly. And if it's not, you wanna make sure you get that fixed and you have the right document in your file. Otherwise, you're gonna have issues, you know, if you're ever audited, typically auditors provide you time to collect these certificates. But what I always tell my clients is that's great. However, especially in this day and age, if a business is sold, 
the business goes out of business, how are you going to get that certificate? I mean, it might be something that's exempt, clearly, but if you don't have the right documentation, then you're going to be on the hook for the tax, unfortunately. Just a couple other issues. Uh, important issue we want to talk about these certificates. You notice on the top of them, on the front page, it says single use or blanket. Um, obviously, if someone gives you a resale certificate and checks the single use box, that's for one invoice, that one purchase they're making from you. If they check the box blanket, that covers all subsequent purchases until it's revoked. So you need to be careful. You know, I, you know, I don't think an auditor is going to give you a hard time necessarily if maybe you're using a single use on multiple, you know, sales to somebody, but you never know. And you really, really these days need to make sure that you're accepting, you know, you know let me let me phrase it this way. Back back in the day, I think, back in the day, um, <laughs> you know, you, you got your resale certificate, you got your exemption certificate from somebody, and you were good. You know, you're, you're kind of your get out of jail free card when the auditor comes. Notice in recent years, auditors are, especially here in New York, are looking at these documents more closely. They're looking to make sure they're completed properly, that all the information is in there. It's signed, it's dated. You know, the right boxes are checked. And then there's always the notion that if you accepted this in good faith, then you were, you were good. But now they're coming back and saying, well, really, you didn't know that this wasn't for resale? Or they're, they're kind of questioning, you know, whether you knew what your client was, your customer was going to do with that material you were selling them, which sounds crazy, but I have seen it where they said, no, you know, you know you're selling this, you, you should have known it wasn't for resale. And it, it gets into a whole thing of issues. So you definitely got to be careful with these, make sure you get them. And then, you know, make sure you understand what that person is giving you and for what type of purchase. We do have one question, Tom, on, while we're talking about the ST-121 and the different ones here. So Joanne has a question. If a client gives us an ST-121, what form do we give our vendor? Um, th that's that's going to depend. I mean, so that we're talking about two different transactions. We're talking about the, the, the sale of the material from, let's say, a manufacturer to you, and then the sale from you to your customer. If you know the sale from you to your customer is exempt, then you would get, you know, obviously you need that SQ-121 if they're using it in an exempt fashion. But I think in that case, you would provide your vendor, the ST120, the resale certificate, because you're not you're not using it in an exempt manner other than for resale purposes. So that's the document you would want to provide, you know, whoever you're buying from is that ST120. Okay, great. Hopefully we answered that for you, Joanne. If you have questions still, let us know. Um, you know, the next slide here, the on filing requirements. I'm just going to kind of briefly talk about these next few things because I really want to try to stay on track. Um, you know, in New York you, and, in, and in most states, you know, there's a couple oddballs out there, but you would file either annually, quarterly, or monthly. Annual filers in New York, it's if you, you know, owe less than $3,000 of tax, you file the SC 101. That's due on March 20th of the following year. Because in New York, obviously, we can't, you know, be normal and have quarterly and file follow a, um, a calendar year time period. We have a fiscal period that, you know, starts, you know, March, April, May is quarter one, June, July, August, September, October, November, and then December, January, February. So February is the end of the year for New York. And then that annual return is due the following uh, March 20th, 20 days after. Now, 
And then for quarterly and monthly filers, it kind of depends on, you know, whether your taxable receipts and your purchases subject to use tax are more or less than $300,000 in a prior quarter. If you're under $300,000, you're going to be quarterly, and you're typically classified as a quarterly filer when you register, unless you kind of indicate what your what you expect your sales or purchases to be on the registration pro during the registration process. Um, so yeah, quarterly, you know, ST100 file that every quarter. Monthly gets a little more complicated. You have two different forms. You have an SP-809 that you file the first two months of the quarter, which is really, you're just kind of estimating on that what your tax due is. And then you true it up and provide all the information on the quarterly SP-810 and, you know, subtract any prepayments, you know, to get to the tax due. You know, there's other schedules that you need to file. You need to be careful. You know, there's you know about 10 more schedules that are associated with the sales tax returns. Um, you know, there's Schedule H for clothing and footwear, Schedule B for utilities and heating fuels, Schedule FR if you're selling motor fuel or diesel motor fuel. So in certain instances, you have to you know include these schedules with your filing. You know, for for your return to be correct. Um, so be careful about that. With um, prompt tax, prompt tax is just I, I I actually have I think one client who's on prompt tax. You have to have more than five hundred thousand dollars of annual tax due. So you have to be a very large company selling or buying a lot of taxable materials, and then you're subject to an accelerated payment schedule. Uh, it, that gets a little confusing for sure, but I don't think there's a lot of people out there, hopefully, who are doing that. And then regarding the e-file mandate, you know, if you're preparing the returns yourself, you're using a computer and you have internet access, you got to file electronically. And I mean, th these days it's very easy to do that on New York's web file. And I'm sure everyone here is already doing that. Just kind of go through the screens and, you know, answer the questions there. Uh, I'm going to kind of skip over um, the elements of the sales and use tax return. Um, I included an SD100 in the handout and kind of uh, boxed in some of these areas. You know, online, it's not like you're filing a return anymore and you're, you're hand, hand writing everything in there. Everything's online. It's going through various screens. Uh, with the New York return, you're answering some questions about the business, whether you made sales, are you... Have you sold vape products or anything like that? Is the business being discontinued? And then you go in and you put your gross sales, all your sales, you know, whatever your non-taxable sales are, and then enter on, you know, if you're looking at the SC100, everything's broken up by county or by jurisdiction, you know, for some of the, the cities within the counties that have uh, collection requirements. And you got to go in through there and just, you know, you put all your information in and your, your tax, any credits you have against sales, maybe from prior periods, you know, some, there was a return that came in, you would put it in the credits, you know, your taxable sales and services, your purchases subject to tax, um, any credits against purchases, and you kind of just work your way through that. And then, you know, you got to look at your vendor collection credit. It's up to $200 here in New York. They calculate that automatically. And then really you just go in and you file and you pay online in the state's web file system. You know, really quite easy to do these days. Don't think, you know, there's too much to it. Every state's pretty similar. Um, they have that same, <coughs> excuse me, process to go about, you know, filing returns. You know, just note again on some penalties here on the next slide. Like I said, returns are due 20 days after the end of the month. Uh, that's the same for most states. A couple states say the 30th day. I think Washington and California come to mind. A um, couple states have more accelerated, like Maine, where it's the 15th day of the month. Um, so you got to watch that. But really, just get your return in. And, and again, Make sure you file, 
and pay. I, mean, I don't think on New York you can't pay. I think you have to file and pay. I don't think there's an option. Some states there's an option where you file and then there's a different screen or a different process to pay. So you know, so you got to remember to do both in those cases. Otherwise, you know, you're going to lose your vendor collection credit. And you're gonna, you know, be subject to that $50 penalty for late file, even if no taxes due. Um, you know, the state has this nice, uh, nice link here: 15 tips to prevent making errors when preparing and filing your sales tax return. Some of them are a little antiquated because, you know, the the calculations are all really done, you know, electronically now and automatically, but. I, you know, some of the ones that really jumped to my mind were, uh, you know, for part quarterly, the monthly filers, you know, when you're filing that thir third month on the SDA 10, the quarterly return, make sure you include the activity for the whole quarter, not just that third month. So if it's March, April, May, make sure you're including March, April, May, not just May on that, because you're summarizing your whole quarter's activity on that return and then just subtracting out any prepayments you've made. Definitely use those schedules. You know, if you're selling the clothing or if you're selling fuels, got to use those. Um, but yeah, so I think, you know, there's some really good stuff on, on that list to take a look at. You know, just maybe keep it with you. Um, you know, double check it every month. Make sure you're doing the right thing. So now, now we've kind of talked about Registration, we've talked about taxable sales and purchases. We've talked about getting those exemption certificates and filing the returns. Now comes the part that nobody wants to deal with is sales and use tax audits. You know, at some point of time or other, you might be subject to an audit by one of these by New York or by another state. So I've got some, you know, guidelines here, some some pointers or tips that I've kind of learned and garnered from my years of, you know, helping clients, you know, manage their audits or work with auditors, you know, here in New York and other states. So I, I think there's some good info here for, for everybody. So what, what's going to happen is you're going to get something in the mail. You're going to get this audit notice. And I have a copy of one here, a nice little letter, you know, in, inviting you to a, to a meeting that they want to have at your, your office um, at some point. Um, don't throw it in the garbage. Uh, they're not going to go away if you don't respond. You're just going to get, you know, get start getting more notices or calls, or they're just going to show up one day. A lot of, a lot of clients just throw it out thinking, uh, oh, if I don't respond, they're not going to come. So you want to, you want to, you want to look at this letter. You want to look at the taxpayer ID, the audit period, uh, and whatnot, make, make sure it's being sent to the right company, so they're auditing the right company. Uh, we've had that happen before where the audit notice came to the company that was at that address, but it was to a predecessor owner. They didn't really understand that there was a new company there, so they were trying to start an audit for somebody that they shouldn't have, and uh, we needed to correct that. And then, you're going to review, they have this IDR, this information documents request, which, you know, it looks like the list that my daughter gives me, you know, around late November with everything that she wants on it for Christmas. And it's everything under the sun. And, you know, they kind of want everything and anything document wise, but uh, some of the stuff, you know, they really do need. And some of it's just, you know, hey, be nice to have. Uh, you know, obviously sales tax returns, your income tax returns, they're going to want to see those because they're going to want to reconcile to see that your, your state or local income tax, your federal or state income tax returns kind of tie to what you're reporting for sales tax purposes. So, you know, I, you might be asking, oh, I'm doing a sales tax audit, why they want that? Because they're going to look at that and make sure there's reconciliation, but that's about all they really, really do with those. You know, we're going to need, like we said, sales invoices, your fixed asset, your purchase invoices and whatnot. So, you know, you definitely want to go through that and make sure you have that stuff. You know, you're going to want to look at what kind of electronic 
system you have you have you have quickbooks or is it something more fancy and complex like an erp system you know an sap oracle anything like that sage is that that's you're going to need to get information out of that and then um you can schedule the date i mean call them schedule the date you know make sure you have some time to get ready for this we'll see on the next slide you know these days you you might be doing a call you might be doing a Teams meeting with them. They may come out on site in New York. I talked to some auditors the other day and they're getting more leeway now to come back on site for local audits. So it's just gotta depend on the auditor and, and the, 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 what they wanna do and feel comfortable with. You know, once you kind of schedule that date, I think it's really important and a lot of people don't do this. You want to conduct your own audit. You know, you want to look at a few things. You want to look at your prior audits if you were ever audited. You know, did you correct the errors from that audit? You know, were you not accruing use tax on something that was taxable? Were you did a bad job with resale certificates? Did you correct that? Because if you didn't, you could be subject to some penalties. You know. Look at those tax returns. Now, your sales and your income tax returns are kind of different periods. Your income tax return might be is calendar year. Your sales tax returns are on that goofy quarter system that we talked about, but they reconcile, right? If you're reporting the right amount of sales for sales tax and for income tax purposes, really needs to make sure that that happens. Um, on your sales, you know, you're charging the right rate of tax in New York. Do I have my resale and exemption certificates? If I have non-taxable sales. You know, fixed assets. You know, you want you're gonna want to go through and look at your list of your assets that you capitalized during the audit period, typically the three-year audit period. You have the invoices for those. You know, did we pay or accrue tax on anything that maybe wasn't production related? Did you sell any assets? Because if you sold an asset, there could be a sales tax obligation that you should have fulfilled and collected tax on it. You know, you want to look at your expenses. You know, do you have you keep your expense, your payable invoices? You know, are they electronic? Do you scan them and keep them in some kind of electronic filing system, or are they all just laid out by by vendor and file cabinets? You know, you're gonna to want to look at the volume of that. And you know, you have a lot of reoccurring purchases from the same vendor. You know, financial reporting, not necessarily here do I mean, you know, your your financial statements if you have them, but, you know, the system that you have, you know, is it QuickBooks, is it something else? How easily can you export data and, you know, reports that the auditor might need? And then again, did anything crazy happen during the audit period? Did you buy the assets of another business? Did you sell assets like that? Did you have an expansion of the facility? <clears throat> All things that you want to think about leading into this audit. And then at some point you're going to have that meeting. You know, you're, you're going to develop your game plan for how you're going to manage this audit. You know, typically what I would say, you want to put a point person in charge, whether it's a controller, accounting manager, tax manager, CFO, you want to put one person that's going to, you know, work directly with the auditor, who's going to handle questions back and forth and information requests. You, you don't want the auditor talking to a million different people. These and something's going to get lost in, in the shuffle there. You want one person that's going to work with that auditor directly. You know, what are your company policies, you know, for visitor access? You know, what, what are you going to do with this auditor? You know, kind of ties into the on-site, off-site, remote audit. You know, where are they going to sit if they come out here to, you know, review these records? You have a conference room that you can use. You don't want them out in general population in the office. These and they hear things. You kind of want to isolate them. Think about, you know, giving them, you know, what access to any photocopiers or scanners or, anything like that that you want you know where's the bathroom even general stuff like that or the break room you know most of the otters you 
you know, you tell them where they can and can't go. They're pretty good with that, but you want to lay that out. You don't want them wandering around, especially if you're a manufacturer. You don't want them out on the floor. Um, you may have to give them a tour so they understand the production process. You know, that's very important. They need to know what's what's where it begins, where it ends, so they can have a good idea of what's exempt and what's not. Gotta be careful with plant tours too. I, and I'm going too long on the slide, but plant tours can lead to lots of problems. Typically, when I'm managing an audit, I'll go out the day before or earlier in the day before the auditor's coming out, and I get to walk through myself. Because I want to see and not see what some issues might be. What equipment, maybe we don't want to talk about too much in detail, right? You know, what stuff do I want them to talk about? Because depending on who's giving the tour, if it's a plant manager, an engineer, the owner, sometimes they love to talk about what they do. And sometimes they talk way too much about what they do and it's gonna get them into trouble. So kind of want to rehearse it, watch them, you know, see what they say. And then I always make sure I kind of stay behind the auditors. So whoever's giving the tour can see me, but the auditors can't see me. So if I'm shaking my head, you know, left and right profusely, they understand that you've said too much, let's move on. But, you know, you, did, you just got to be careful with that stuff. And again, with the on-site, off-site, some auditors are still going to want to work remote, which means you have to provide stuff to them electronically, which whether it's data or it's invoices, that can be a hassle. A lot of my clients don't even want the auditor there. You know, we do a lot of audits right out of our office. We, you know, the conference room up front, we meet with the auditors, provide them the information, answer their questions, and they work directly with us. So those are all things you want to think about with that. You know, you're going to get to that opening conference and you're going to want to set some ground rules, right? You know, like we talked about here. What's the timeline? You know, how long are you going to be on site? You know, how long do you think this field work's going to last? Because if I got to pull stuff, I got to allocate somebody to pull these documents for you, and they're not going to be doing their other job. So you want to find that stuff out. Uh, you want to find out if they're going to use any type of sampling. I mean, there's a good chance for your sales or your expense purchases. They might want to do a month sample or a quarter sample, or if you're large enough, even a statistical sample. What does that mean? You know, what level of documents do you have to pull and how is the tax extrapolated or projected based on that sample? Uh, waivers, I included a waiver in the handout here. You know, waivers basically extend the statute of limitations. So, you know, they might be coming up on the statute, they try to come out, you know, within a certain amount of time frame to get the audit done, but some of the older quarters might be starting to expire. So, you know, you want to play along and, you know, you want to you may give them a waiver, you know, or two, especially if it's taking you a long time to get stuff together. But at some point you got to watch, you know, if you keep giving waivers or letting them take the waiver, you know, the audit's never got to end. So you really have to be careful about that. But I think the most important thing, you want to like set a good tone for the audit and create a positive working relationship. That's, I think, the one thing I've learned over my years. When I first started, you know, 20 some years ago, like Carolyn said, it was very adversarial with the auditors. You know, some of the old school guys I work with, it was like, you're taking their money. You're stealing money out of their pocket. And it created a lot of tension and a lot of, a lot of arguing back and forth on stuff. These days, it, it's not so much the case. You know, I think I've learned that you want to work with the auditor and in a lot of cases, do as much work for the auditor as you can. I think that helps move the audit process along and keep things on, on a friendly ter on term. So when you get to the end of the audit and you got to negotiate, there's some good faith there. There's some good feelings. You know, eventually the auditor is going to go through sales. They're going to go through your invoices for fixed assets and expenses. They're going to come up with a preliminary assessment. You know, and they're going to give you some time to look at that. You want to prioritize the exceptions. 
you know, you may not be able to look at everything. And some of the low dollar stuff, you just, you may not want to even bother with. You know, I, I always look at the old 80-20 rule. You know, if I can cover the big stuff, you know, 80% of the, the tax due with, you know, 20, 25% of the purchases or 25% of the audit, then I'm going to cover that. Um, you know, it, it just depends on how much time you have for this. Because you're going to have to really prepare to meet with the auditor. And what I mean by prepare is, you know, you've got to review the exceptions. If it's a purchase, right? And they're challenging that this, you know, purchase isn't used in an exempt manner in production. You got to get out there and find out how it's used. The plant guys, you know, get some supporting documentation, whether it's pictures from the facility, whether it's documents from the internet. Check if use tax was accrued. Don't know how many times I've had auditors list something that's taxable where they didn't understand how the use tax was accrued, or maybe it was broken up into a couple different line items or they just even bother checking. So you've got to do that. On your sales, get those exemptions and resale certificates, right? Call your customers, they'll take a backdated certificate in most case, but you know, you got to do your work on that end of it, right? You know, present those items you feel should be removed. Understand the impact an item has on the assessment, especially if you're using sampling. You know, it might be a small dollar invoice, but it might multiply, you know, a number of times, you know, if they're, if they're projecting it, if they're doing a sample. So you got to understand how that's going to work um, in, in there. And then be willing to negotiate. Like I said, this is where it kind of comes, you know, New York audits, especially, I always feel like there's some level of negotiation that goes on, some hank hankering back and forth at the end. You know, they want to close the audit out and move on, and you don't want to pay tax. So there's some level of negotiation that's that's always there. You know, be willing to do some horse trading, maybe. And then, you know, at the end, if, you know, if there's something you can't settle with an auditor, they're giving you a hard time, maybe that's when you want to, you know, go over their head to their team leader, you know, to their section head, they typically provide that information. You typically have the team leader involved in the beginning of the audit, so you know who they are. You know, tread lightly with that. You know, I always tell clients, don't don't go running up to the, the team leader every time something happens. Try to work it out because, I mean, you know how it is yourself. You know, you don't like someone going to your boss and complaining about you. You know, it's going to be the same way with the auditor. So at the end of the day, you know, you're going to have that exit conference with them, you know, address, you know, any issues, you know, that can't be resolved. And by resolved, I mean stuff that you don't agree with. I mean, if taxes do, taxes do, you know, there's nothing you can do about that. But if it's an issue, you know, you don't feel good about, that's maybe when you want to pull the team leader in. You know, you want to discuss administrative procedures, you know, what's going to happen next with um, audits and whatnot and penalties and interest. Typically, if, you know, if it's a routine audit, you're not going to get any penalties. You're just going to get some minimum interest on it. And you, you want to find out the deadlines for how much time do I have to pay this? And then, you know, what are my options for appeals? And uh, at that point, the auditor is going to send this next document in the handout, this AU346, that kind of lists the tax due or by quarter plus the interest and penalty. If you're good, sign that you agree with it and move on. You know, if you disagree, then you sign that as well. And then, you know, the appeal process kicks in. But, you know, maybe there's stuff you agree with and maybe there's one issue that you disagree with. They can break it out into two AU346s. Don't continue to pay interest on something that you agree with. Just pay it, get it over with, and move on just to the one issue you want to challenge. You'll get this audit verification letter, which is the next handout. Basically shows that you were audited for what period, 
you know, how much tax was due. These are great. You keep these around. You might get a call from a customer or a vendor who's being audited for that same period. If you provide them with this letter, then that issue goes away essentially for them. Or it could happen for you as well. They can't audit the same transaction twice. So it's important to think about using audit verification letters and seeing if your customers or your suppliers may have been audited for the same period. Um, that's when we get into you know, an appeals situation here. You gotta think about a few things before you decide to appeal. Obviously, the amount of tax. Is this worth it? Does it have a future impact on your business or an industry? Is this a recurring issue that's gonna happen again in the future? You know, what's your level of assurance essentially that you think you can get this removed if you appeal? You can get the assessment changed. If it's, you know, one in 10, you know, maybe if it's, you know, one in three, then yeah, I mean, yeah, I would maybe go for it. Then you got to factor in, do you need outside tax or legal counsel? Because you're going to at some point, probably. So you just want to weigh the cost versus the benefit of doing all this. And, you know, Carolyn, you can just skip ahead to the next one. Here in New York, our appeals process is, is kind of, well, can, can be very large and it's a monstrosity. So if you look at the flow chart, you go from an audit to, you can appeal then to this Bureau of Conciliation and Mediation Services, BCMS. That's your first kind of level of appeal. And in this case, you and the auditor basically present your information to a third party arbitrator that works for the state. Um, and they kind of make it a ruling, whether yay or nay, they agree or disagree with the audit findings. You know, most of the time they disagree with the audit findings. So you would then go up to the division of tax appeals, and then you could present your case to an administrative law judge or an ALJ. You'd go to an ALJ from BCMS, you can always go directly to an ALJ too. I would advise you to get an attorney who understands how this process works. It is a pseudo court type process. So you need someone who's very familiar with how to handle this. If at that point you're still not happy, you can appeal up to the tax appeals tribunal, which is just essentially a tribunal of people who will hear your case versus the state's and make a decision, that's as far as the state can go. The state cannot appeal further to that than that. You know, at that point, you know, if you're still feel it's a case where, I and mean, it's gotta be, it's gotta be some bucks at this point, and it's gotta have some ramifications, you can take it to a judicial level. Um, I've never, I've never, I've honestly never done before, after an ALJ. You know, we've gotten attorneys involved and, and whatnot, but we try to resolve as much as we can. So, you know, and I've included in here what the sample petitions for BCMS, you know, and for the tax uh, ALJ hearings look like, so you have an idea of what you're filling out. And then really just want to talk about post audit considerations. I know I'm at my time, I'm going to try to wrap this up. Um, quickly here. So you want to improve compliance. You know, you were audited and maybe you got dinged a bit, maybe you got dinged a lot. You know, if your issues are small, you know, definitely some of the things you want to do, schedule meetings to review tax law changes and other concerns. Maybe that's what you got beat up on. Maybe the state came out with a new procedure, maybe a new law passed, you weren't on top of it, so you got dinged a little. You know, you might want to prepare some internal tax guides. You know, all the things I can say bad about New York State, they have more information and more publications and more tax bulletins than any other state. So they really try to convey how things are taxed. Maybe you prepare some internal guidance. If you're 
you know, some high level transactions are coming in. Maybe you're buying some software. There's a building improvement, a big piece of equipment. And you don't know how it's really going to be used. You look at the high dollar transactions. Or if you've got deemed on sales, you didn't have exemption certificates. Well, maybe you got to put some policies in place. Maybe the salesmen have to get this or, you know, AR has got to make sure, you know, before an invoice goes out, you have the right certificate, certificate, certificates, excuse me. On the other hand, if you have big issues, you know, you get dinged a lot, maybe, you know, you really need to put some new internal controls in place. Maybe there needs to be some guidance out there or some policies regarding how use tax has got to be administered. You know, maybe you want to automate compliance or outsource it, you know, to a third party, you know, to handle that. Maybe there's some alternative methods for calculating use tax. You know, we, we kind of do some things with that. Or maybe it's just a different person needs to be put in charge of it. Um, you know, some of the other areas, obviously, that can be problems on audits, <coughs> tax abatements like IDA exemptions you know, what's really exempt and what's not. Bulk sales, if you purchase the assets of a company, you know, did you pay tax on the taxable assets? That'll come up. Utilities, especially for manufacturers, can be a problem. You know, are you taking an exemption on the electricity or natural gas used in production process? Maybe you have multiple locations and you buy stuff centrally here with the headquarters. You know, are you, you know, paying the right amount of tax here? You know, is there use tax due in other states? You know, you could have other industry specific issues as well that you want to contemplate, you know, based on the type of business you have. So, you know, really roughly just the last couple of slides, um, some other issues that kind of come up with compliance. Maybe you've overpaid. We talked earlier about that company that wasn't issuing resale certificates and they had an overpayment. Well, if you do, you can get a refund on that. You file this AU11 form that I included in the handouts. Uh, you've got to include the schedule, a schedule of all the overpayments with all the appropriate information, copies of the invoices, copies of canceled checks showing that the tax was paid. And you just, you can send that right directly to Albany you know, and, and file this refund claim. Or in some cases, you can just take a credit on your return. You know, if there's any purchases that are subject to a credit, you can, you know, take that, claim it on the return and either, you know, get that credit forward or refunded, but you still have to file an AU11 with that. You know, if it's a big claim, I typically like just to file it directly with Albany, handle it, don't muck up the compliance. You know, we're talking about New York here and sales tax filing requirements. What about other states? This is a whole other <laughs> webinar. And actually, it will be a whole other webinar in September that we're going to do on, you know, whether you need to file in other states due to maybe physical presence or now economic nexus in these states. But, you know, just some questions here you want to think about, you know, if you do may maybe have a lot of sales in other states. And then finally, yeah, I mentioned this as well, voluntary disclosure. You know, maybe you're not filing, maybe your filing is really not good and you think you owe a lot of tax. Uh, there's an opportunity to do what we call a voluntary disclosure. You go to the state and, you know, basically tell them, you know, we've made mistakes, you know, we want to correct them. And hopefully, you know, they accept you into the voluntary disclosure program and you can avoid some penalties or even criminal charges if we're really talking about an issue. Um, you can apply for that online. You know, we help a lot of clients with VDAs, as we call them here in New York and other states. So that's all that I have. I'm sorry for going over. I know we started a few minutes late. Carolyn, do we have any questions? We do, we have two of them in here um, and most people are still on, so hopefully we can get this answered. Sure. So Carol, ask the question, what can trigger an audit or are sales tax audits at random? Yeah, you know, Carl, it's, it's kind of both. 
Um, sometimes the state might just be going after certain industries. A number of years ago, they were all up in arms on restaurants and bars. You know, sometimes it's the luck of the draw. Sometimes, you know, what, what the state does, and I don't think people are aware, is their, their computer systems are very certificate, sophisticated. A lot of AI involved, and they're constantly looking at things on these returns. You know, if you're, they're looking at their ratios, you know, on sales, your taxable purchases to your gross sales for industries. If your taxable purchases are maybe off from what the industry standard is, could generate an audit notice. You know, if you, you know, sell a business or whatnot, that can generate an audit. But there's really, a lot of people always say, Tom, I don't want to file a refund claim because I'm going to get audited. That typically never happens. So it's kind of random, but it's also what the state system is telling it. You know, the information it's spitting out about certain companies and what the kind of tax they're remitting. Great. Thank you. Um, Michael, thank you for the comment. And we're going to flip back to Joanne. Joanne was the one asking about her vendor and the ST121. Um, not sure if this helps clarify a little bit more of her question. We are a contractor and can't use a resale. Well, in that case, Joanne, you'd have to use an ST120.1, the contractor's resale certificate. Um, that, I mean, if you have questions on that, you know, feel free to shoot me an email or give me a call because really kind of need to know a little bit more of the facts and circumstances of what you're selling. So you're basically saying you're selling tangible personal property for resale that you're not installing. So that, that, there's some issues with that. So definitely feel free to uh, reach out. We can talk directly on that. Great. Thank you. Not to keep anybody too long today, we will wrap it up. I will have a post webinar survey coming your way. If you could just fill that out, let us know if you want to meet with Tom one on one over the phone or a Zoom call. Um, give us some feedback. We are taking a little summer break, um, giving Tom a well deserved break from webinars. We will be back in September with our fall lineup. So stay tuned for that. And also I will send you an email either later today or first thing in the morning with again, a copy of the recording, copy of the slides and that additional handout that Tom kept referring to. Thank you for joining us. Have a great day. Enjoy that summer weather. Thanks. Thanks everybody.